never miss our updates and be part of our conversation squad. Are we live? Yes, sir, we are live. Good evening, friends. Good evening to this month and today. And we have a, we are privileged to have uh, Sumeru Roy Chaudhary and uh, Akhil Bakshi talking to us on the life of Netaji Shubhas in the Bose. More important to talk about his mysterious, uh, what they think is mysterious about the air crash in Taiwan. Shubhas Chandra Bose was a hero for all of us. He still continues to be a hero. And uh, his brilliant mind, his magnetic personality, his boundless courage are all actually part of legend. In school, when we were in school, we heard stories of Netaji uh, surfacing in India as various persons. And later, uh, a popularized as Gugnami Baba but hiding for reasons best known to him. Sumeru today will be in conversation with Akhil Bakshi, exploring all these possibilities and absurdities. I also want to, uh, uh, I'm also glad that uh, we have today with us, a little later after the conversation, uh, Asha Chaudhary, a close associate of Netaji and a lieutenant at the INA. I'll be introducing her a little later after the conversation. And finally, we are deeply privileged to have Dr. Anita Pfaff, uh, Netaji's daughter, who lives in Germany. And uh, we thank you for uh, being part of today's event. I want to thank, in particular, Madhuri Bose and Sangamitra. Uh, we have a word for her. Uh, she's one of the many solid Manthanites we have, who, both of them, Madhuri and Sangamitra, who made this event happen. Thank you and welcome. And uh, at the outset, let me introduce the two conversationalists today. Sumeru Roy Chaudhary is a graduate from IIT Kharagpur. He did his post-graduation in University of Nottingham. Uh, he works as a chief architect in the CPWD of the Government of India. He has done extensive work and in-depth study on the uh, declassified government files. Uh, and a lifelong admiration of Netaji has led him to study the life of Netaji in, in his book, Netaji as Gumnami, India's Biggest Hoax. Uh, Sumeru draws on investigative reports prepared by the Allied forces, Japan and Taiwan. Uh, usually these are not generally available to the public. And I'm sure in this conversation with Akhil Baksu, we will know a lot of home truths. Akhil is the founding director of Nehru Yubakendra Sanghatan in the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports. Uh, he developed the institution into youth movement and one of the largest grassroots organizations in the country today. To commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of India's Independence by the provisional government of Azad Hind, he organized and led the Azad Hind expedition from Singapore to the Red Fort to refresh the national memory of the sacrifices made by the soldiers of INA. INA itself is a unique institution in a unique army uh, which fought for independence. And we are glad today at Manthan that we are part of this conversation and we hope to have an in-depth discussion on the way forward. Thank you. Thank you, Sumeru. Thank you, Akhil, for being with us and the conversation is yours. You can unmute. Oh, yeah. You have to unmute yourself, Akhil. Sumeru also. Sumeru also. Yeah. All right. Uh, Sumeru, let me begin this conversation by saying how impressed I am with the exhaustive and meticulous research you have done for writing this book. You went through thousands of pages of reports, documents, witness testimonies, classified and declassified files to conclusively establish that Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose indeed died of injuries suffered in the plane crash in Taiwan on August 18th, 1945. You have also provided solid and concrete evidence to disprove 
the theories, uh, rather stories, of those who claimed that Netaji did not meet his end on that fateful day and continued to live in Russia, China, Tibet, India, under various identities. Your book leaves no room for any controversy. Tell me, what moved you to write this book, Netaji of Gumnami, and how long did it take? Namaskar. Thank you for the appreciation. Uh, Netaji has been my idol of patriotism since childhood. My parents believed, and we did too, that Netaji escaped from Southeast Asia and was killed by the Russians. But they were not sure. Then when I was at high school, emerged Sholomari Sadhu as Netaji in North Bengal in the first half of 1960s. I followed avidly all the development reported in the newspapers. I witnessed how the entire story that the sadhu was Netaji was ultimately squashed. Hmm. So the Russian story continued again. Then much later, it was in 2013, when I was approached by a proponent of another new story, Gumnami Baba is Netaji. And the person tried to persuade me to accept the finding. I rubbished the story on its face value as what we was, he was telling me about Gumnami Baba was totally opposite to Netaji's character. Can you imagine Netaji spending 40 years in hiding from his own countrymen, but mm -hmm. serving China, Vietnam, Korea, and not bothering about the partition of his motherland? riots, starvation, internal emergency. He remained inert when his captured army officers, his colleagues, his generals, were sent for court martial and hundreds of his soldiers massacred in one night at Nilganj near Barakpur, Kolkata. Mm. Can this man be Netaji? The story of Gumnami is nothing but an insult and denigration of Netaji. I had the direct knowledge of 1960s Soilomari Sadhu episode behind me. Then, my rejection of the Gumnami story provoked unexpected attacks against me on social media. Mm. The word troll was not in vogue those days. But now I can understand I was being trolled with abuses of the filthiest order no. and was threatened to. Now, but this triggered the passion in me to do a serious study on the mortal end of Netaji. The declassification of remaining Netaji files in 2016 by the government came as a boon. The study led to the conclusion that Netaji indeed died in a plane crash in, on 18th August 1945. I began to make public in an organized manner through my social media group, the findings from the file declassified in India mm -hmm. and abroad. This helped me to serialize the flaws in the conspiracy theories on Netaji's death. I also got the opportunity to present my findings as a regular columnist on Netaji issue in web magazine and have appeared in discussion and on All India TV channels. Mm -hmm. My continuous activity in social media groups against fake and unsubstantiated narratives led to several cyber attacks on my social media account and Whoa. group. Whoa. You know, so, so this, uh, to save these findings, hmm. the attacks prompted me to document my findings in, in hard copy format. Okay. This book, Netaji as Gumnami, uh, Gumnami, India's uh, biggest hoax documents all that is fake about the st story supported by official documents. In particular, it also contains photocopies of what you are telling, investigative reports prepared by the Allied forces, Japan and Taiwan, which yeah. are not easily available to the general public. The purpose for this is to reach a larger number of people, especially the younger generation, in order 
that the attempts by the conspiracy storytellers to expand their influence are challenged and halted. Good. Earlier, I had brought out a book, Russian Theory is a Fancy, hmm. where the flaws of the Russian theory is documented. Of course, the Russian angle is now on the wane. Well, uh, regarding how long did uh, uh, did the, my research take and the writing take? Actually, the ingredients were already there yeah. in my social media group built since 2016. The last cyber attack was in January. And this uh, January this year. And then I decided to convert the data to hard copy. So this is so, uh, uh, Sumeru, now th th there were 11 investigations and inquiries that were conducted to find out whether Nedaji died or disappeared. Could you give us a synopsis of uh, their findings? Okay. Yes. There are a total of 11 in investigations and inquiries. Most of us are aware of the three inquiries conducted by India government. But hmm. well before government of India decided to carry out its first inquiry, the allied forces had conducted several investigations on what happened to Bose, their biggest enemy. A total of six investigations were carried out by the foreign authorities. Two by the allied forces, two by the Japanese authorities, and one by the British India government, and one by the Taiwanese government. Hmm. Now, all these six investigations were unknown to us till okay. 2016 end. I give you the brief summary of them. Oh. First, soon after Japan surrendered, they surrendered on 15th August, and their declaration of Netaji's death was on 23rd August. Hmm. So soon after Japan surrendered, on August 30, 1945, Admiral Mountbatten sent a request to General MacArthur for an inquiry about the death of Netaji. Accordingly, on September 19th, within 19 days, the Japanese government submitted a preliminary report to MacArthur's office. Among other details, it hmm. stated that Bose was injured in an air crash on August 18th at Taihoku and died the same evening. This was the first report which came by uh, September 19th. We didn't know all these things till 2016. No. Next, next was the British India government's investigation. In the same month, that is September 45, the British India government sent two superintendents of police, Finney and Davis, assisted by two Indian inspectors, H.K. Roy and K.P. Day, to Bangkok, Saigon, and uh, Taihoku. To find out both. They interrogated the in charge of the Saigon airport, mm. the military officers at Taihoku airport, and the chief medical officer of the military hospital at Taihoku. At Bangkok, they retrieved a telegram dated August 20th, 45, sent from the chief of the staff of Japan's Southern Army to Hikari Kekan. A body set up to Hikari Kikan is the body set up to liaise between the Japanese government and the Azadin government. Yeah. So they recovered a telegram which carried the message of the plane crash and Netaji's death. These two investigations were enough. I mean, they clearly concluded right. that Netaji was dead. Hmm. But rumors continued in India that he was alive and would return. And the popular support for the INA veterans unnerved the British. So, a few months later, in mid 1946, Colonel John Figgis, a senior British intelligence officer on attachment in Tokyo, was deputed to carry out another round of investigation, that is the third of its kind, into the fate of both. Between May and July of 1946, Figgis interrogated six Japanese officials in Tokyo, which included the Japanese doctor, Suruta, Dr. Suruta, who treated Netaji at the Nanmon Hospital, that's the military hospital's name, branch name, at Taihoku. 
biggest submit is his report on 25th July 46 where he concluded it is confirmed for certain that SC Bose died in a Taihoku military mm -hmm. hospital on 18th August 1945. Mm. Then comes the fourth investigation. Near about the same time, Captain Alfred Turner of the War Crimes Liaison Section of Taiwan interrogated the CMO of the Nanmon Hospital, Dr. Yoshumi, who was then imprisoned at the Stanley Jail in Hong Kong. His testimony was recorded in October 1946, which confirmed Netaji's death on the night of 18. These are the four investigations conducted within a year of 1945. Mm, yeah. So the, the Allied forces were certain that Netaji was no more. They gave up the chase for Netaji also due to this. Then much later, in 1955, India government decided to conduct an inquiry on Netaji's death or disappearance, as you may call it. So India sought Japan's permission to conduct an inquiry on their soil. Japan, while giving the permission, submitted a detailed report to India in January 1956. This is the fifth investigative report. It comprised of interviews with 13 witnesses, mm -hmm. including Netaji's co-passengers and doctors who attended on him in the military hospital in Taihoku. Mm -hmm. There too, the findings were the same. In addition, in that report, they mentioned that Bose's cremated remains were handed over to Mr. Ayer and the retrieved articles left by Bose to Mr. Murthy on September 8, 1945 at the Imperial Headquarters in Tokyo. Hmm. At the same year, now comes the sixth report. The sixth report is the Taiwanese report. India was not having diplomatic relations with Taiwan when the Shanawas Khan committee was in session and India could not India could not send the delegation over there. So, in June 56, India requested UK to ask the Taiwanese government to interview employees of the Nanmon Hospital and Taipei Cremation Center. The Taiwanese government sent the eyewitnesses account to the UK mission, who in turn sent it to the government of India. The mm. Taiwanese report cast no doubt on the details of the crash or the subsequent death and cremation of Netaji. Yeah. Now, all these six reports were made known to us only in 2016 through de declassification of Indian files. Now, the, those are the six of the 11. And three we know are the Indian ones. In addition to that, there were two private investigations. The first Indian investigation was conducted by Harin Shah a war correspondent of Bombay's Free Press Journal. Hmm. Shah visited Taihoku in September 1946 and later published his findings in his book uh, Verdict from Formosa, The Gallant End of Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. Among many other evidences, he recorded the testimony of the nurse at the Nanmond Hospital. Her account matched with that recorded of figures in July 46. The nurse took Shah to the ward and the bed where she said most had passed away. Hmm. As readers like, as see, we like sensational news. Yeah. So what happened when Harin Shah cabled back to his headquarters in Bombay, Bombay. that his finding was that Netaji died in a plane crash. His journal head cabled back to him saying, Netaji dead is no news. If he is alive, return immediately. Hire a plane. And in those days, you know, hiring a plane was an astronomical figure affair. Hmm. The journal was prepared to spend any amount if Shah could come back with a sensational story that hmm. Netaji is alive. alive. So people of those days were no different from us. <laughs> uh, at the same time, uh, in 1953, members of the Indian Independence League, in short, okay. IIL, the, uh, IIL was the civil administrative wing of the Azad Hind government. 
they published an investigative report in two parts based on their investigation was based on hmm. circumstantial evidence and individual contacts they had okay. which they carried out in the past several years hmm. up to 1953 the iil members also came to the conclusion that there was a plane crash and netaji died of the injuries from it so the these are the eight investigation by six foreign authorities and two privately by indian the remaining three are the enquiries conducted by the indian government which most of us know but still i'll just run through them okay i'll give you an the six foreign investigations actually were not known to us and obviously demand for a official probe into the fate of netaji continued to grow in india and in 1956 the government formed the netaji inquiry committee the purpose was to enquire into the circumstances concerning the departure of netaji this is what is written over there from mm. bangkok about the 16th of uh, august 1955 is alleged death as a result of an aircraft accident the committee consisted of shanawas khan who was a former major general of the ina yeah he was court martialed and sentenced to death by the british in 1946 which was later commuted in 56 he was then the parliamentary secretary the other in the committee others in the committee were netaji's older brother suresh chandra bose and asan maitra of the indian civil service the shanawas khan committee findings are a voluminous work digitized and now available in the public domain the committee examined 67 witnesses including 11 ai witnesses who confirmed netaji's death as a result of burn injury they cross examined five of the six persons who had accompanied mm. netaji on his last flight from bangkok including habibur rahman the committee could not visit tayoku as i told you the crash site and as, as india did not have diplomatic relation but the final report was not unanimous the majority report signed by shanawas khan and maitra was accepted by the parliament which concluded like the previously mentioned eight investigation that netaji died as a result of a plane crash at tayoku on 18th august 45 the committee was criticized for not visiting taihoku and in addition to that the appearance of a saradananda sadhu at shaulomari ashram in north bengal no oh. in the 60s who okay. many believe to be netaji in cognito hmm. led to the persistent demand for further inquiry so people were not satisfied with the shanawas committee report as saradananda sadhu the shaulomari sadhu in short come so in 1970 the government formed the justice koshla commission under retired justice gd koshla mm. and their purpose was to enquire into all the facts and circumstances relating to the disappearance of netaji in 1945 okay okay so but unsurprisingly nothing new came out of the koshla mm. commission justice koshla interviewed four of the uh, four of netaji's co passengers and five eyewitnesses to the crash over a period of four years the uh, committee continued uh, the commission continued he also interviewed shanawas khan suresh bose and 224 other witnesses he concluded like the others before him that netaji had been grievously injured by the aircraft crash at ayoku and died the same night yet the khosla commission also patiently recorded new sightings of bos here started all the new sightings of bos of an mp's chance meeting with netaji at marseille airport in 1946 of an ardent admirer of bos a bureaucrat who claimed that a soviet army officer saw a well dressed bos publicly going to the kremlin with high dignitaries on 24th december of 1956 and in contrast another mp claiming that bos 
languishing in languishing in cell number 45 of a right. prison in Siberia. See what contrast. All these things. Uh, so there are 224. All this bakwas was being recorded. Still others submitted photographs purportedly showing both visiting Peking in 1952 with right. the Mongolian trade union delegation. All these things you will find in my book. And in the yeah, same okay. year, a socialist party member meeting Netaji dressed as a Burmese monk at mm -hmm. the Zengun's in Yar Lake. As story upon fantastic story piled up, Justice Mukherjee rightly wondered to what extent fantasy and perversion of truth can proceed. Now, coming to the last, the 11th of the inquiries. Now, even after these direct inquiries by government, many Indians could not accept their findings. So in 1999, more than half a century after the incident, government appointed a third commission led by retired Justice Manoj Mukherjee to find out whether Subhas Chandra Bose is dead or alive. Number two, if he is dead, whether he died in the plane crash. Number three, whether the ashes at Renkoji are of Netaji. Mm. Number four, whether he has died in any other manner at any other place, when and how. And the fifth one, if he is alive, his whereabouts. This commission interviewed 131 persons, but only one in Japan. No. You know, yet, but 20 from Faizabad, mm. another seven from Lucknow and Kanpur. So these figures somewhat give you, give away the, in, the intention. Okay. The commission concluded that Netaji did not die in plane crash. Therefore, the ashes of Netaji at uh, the Renkoji temple cannot be of Netaji. But Justice Mukherjee could not answer the main purpose of the inquiry. That is, if not in plane crash, how else, when, and where Netaji died? He couldn't answer, answer that. Thus, government rejected the Mukherjee Commission report after two days of discussion in both houses of parliament in May and July 2006 where 13 MPs from 12 different parties participated. Yet, many people wrongly propagate that the Mukherjee Commission was rejected. Mukherjee Commission was rejected by the government without assigning any reason. What a lie they spread. Mm. This propaganda, to what extent is mischievous, you can now understand. Besides, many of Mukherjee's findings were based on flawed assumptions if time permits, I can give you the details of his okay. broad assumptions later. All right. Okay. Uh, let me just uh, get back to the Shah Nawaz Commission of 1956, which you said was, you know, one of the first uh, government-appointed committees to investigate right. about the rumors about Netaji being alive. Now, this commission, as you said, concluded that it, Netaji had indeed died as a result of the plane crash. Now, you also mentioned that one of the three members of this uh, committee was Netaji's elder brother, S.C. Bose, right? Yeah. But tell me, uh, Mr. Bose, he signed the draft report, which concluded you know, that Netaji had died. But later, he changes his mind and refuses to sign the final report. Why did he change his mind? See, why Suresh Chandra Bose Changed his mind can somewhat be deduced from the dissent report he placed two months after the final report was tabled in Parliament mm -hmm. by Shahnawaz Khan and Maitra. But before that, we need to be aware of the fact. Depositions and cross examinations of the witnesses and study of all official records by Shahnawaz committee mm -hmm. ended in June 1956. That is, by June 1956, the inquiry was over. And on conclusion of the inquiry, the committee prepared a three-page draft report, which uh, you just mentioned. Hmm. The committee prepared a three-page draft report titled, 
principal points agreed to and the what were the principal points agreed to one was there had been an air crash at taihoku on 18th august 45 in which netaji met his death that he was cremated there and the ashes lying in the renkoji temple in tokyo are held all three members of the committee including suresh chandra bose signed this draft report on 2nd july 56 hmm. i think if it can be shown that that draft report by suresh chandra bose uh, signed the principal points of agreement if that can be shown uh, otherwise so you got it he had signed the principal points of agreement yeah but strangely soon after signing the draft report today's boss took a different view and did not sign the final report the final report signed by khan and maitro was submitted on 3rd august mm -hmm. and the parliament accepted the majority decision in september now suresh bose after signing the draft report and without examining any other person or going through any new documents prepared a decent report which he submitted oh. on 9th october all right okay the decent report was placed in the parliament in november that too was placed in the parliament when he say hmm. it was it was not placed that is also a wrong propaganda the decent report had two broad features one is allegation and two is contradiction in the deposition hmm. so what are the allegations he makes allegations and charges of impropriety against various people mainly jawaharlal nehru chanawas khan and to hmm. some lesser extent his uh, his committee colleague sn maitra then the chief minister of uh, west bengal dr b c roy then bureaucrat t n call and s k roy then he then questions in in this recent report he, he questions the composition of the committee hmm. he, he participate but then he questions the composition of the committee so these things when uh, hits are i i mean he alleged that shanawas was unscrupulous and biased he uses this word he complains harassment obstruction and pressure on him regarding his accommodation in delhi okay. and these are the allegation uh, a personal thing and the second on the uh, contradictions he details out mainly four contradictions in the deposition that according to him goes to prove that there was no air crash no oh. what was the uh, what are those four contradictions that is one is the height from which the plane fell according to him as seven witnesses gave different heights from which the plane fell he concluded that there was no take off thus no crash the fact is that it was rather naive to ask such question to the passengers one should have some idea of the plane they were in a bomber these planes had no windows they were all sitting on the ground it had just the pilot's 180 degree window and the dorsal turret above except pilots all passengers were squatting on the floor there was no chance of the passengers seeing the outside hmm. to get an idea of the height for yeah. example in a conventional closed elevator can you guess which floor you are at fourth or 40th unless you see the indicator so it was pointless to consider the discrepancies mentioned by the passengers inside hmm. rather the two ground engineers who were uh, who were outside their figures somehow were near about second was discrepancy he said is the type of vehicle that carried netaji from airport to the hospital some of the witnesses reported that netaji was taken in a lorry others say he was taken in a shidosha a typical japanese lorry used for starting aeroplane propeller no. this discrepancy he said was unexpected from army men therefore suresh bose says that they this indicate that they were making up stories and thus crash never happened the third discrepancy he points out is the time of death yes hmm. the time narrated by different persons the doctors the nurses the medical orderly the interpreter all give the death time from between 8 pm and 11 pm 
and this shows yeah. that the evidence is worthless. He concludes and concocted to support the secret plan between the Japanese and Netaji to announce Netaji's death. But he gives no evidence of any secret plan. Then the fourth one is regarding the watch, which Netaji was supposed to uh, was wearing. Yeah. Rahman handed over a rectangular watch to Bhulawai Desai, saying the watch was passed to him by Dr. Yoshimi, the CMO of the hospital, as the belonging of Netaji. Mm. But photograph, all photograph evidence show that Netaji always wore a round watch. Okay. So Suresh was concluded, Habibur was lying. Mm. Besides this, he writes, there was a plan for Netaji to escape along with General Shidai to Manchuria, who was mm. his co-passenger. And on reaching there, the Japanese would declare that Netaji had died. But he <clears throat> produces nothing in support of this assumption. Rather, mm -hmm. he misinterprets what SAIR, one of the Netaji's initial co-passengers, deposed to the committee, he misinterprets. He mentions names of several Japanese, but none of them deposed that there was a pre-plan that they would declare Netaji dead. I mean, there's no proof that it is all assumption. Today, Bush also opined the fact that the British India government, which sent a team to Southeast Asia in September, the second investigation which I mentioned, the British India government, the team they sent, they sent uh, to arrest Netaji mm. after the news of death. They could not find Netaji even after scouring the entire area. That proves that Netaji had escaped somewhere else. All right. That's what Suresh Bosch uh, gotcha. concluded in his dissent report. And he has another thing also. He assumed that Netaji was declared an international war criminal, which was incorrect. Mm. Mm. And he was convinced that Rahman was under an oath of secrecy. This has been exploited extensively. It is being exploited extensively till now. He was convinced that Rahman was under an oath of secrecy, but produces no evidence in support of his conviction. All right. Uh, now, you, you, uh, you, you, you've been speaking of these witnesses. Now, who are the eyewitnesses of the plane crash and of Netaji's death who deposed before the inquiry commissions? And did all uh, the three Indian appointed uh, uh, commissions interrogate them? Yeah, uh, I'll let you know. The C, the Shahnawaz committee was held 11 years after the incident. Hmm. It examined 11 eyewitnesses, which comprises of six of the seven survivors of the plane. Two doctors who attended hmm. Netaji, two ground engineers who were at the airport, and the uh, interpreter who was brought in, Nakamura. So these were the 11 eyewitnesses which Shahnawaz committee could uh, examine. Hmm. Then the Khosla commission was held 25 to 29 years after the incident. Later. And they could interview four of Netaji's co-passengers and five eyewitnesses to the crash. And the Mukherjee commission constituted furthest removed from the time of the incident, 55 to 60 years after the incident, interviewed just one eyewitness, Dr. Yoshimi, who was then over 90 years old. Besides them, the Allied forces, the Japanese and the Taiwanese, uh, they interviewed some more eyewitnesses, the nurses mm -hmm. and the crematorium staff. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So uh, let us now come to the issues, you know, which are raised by those who believe that Netaji did not die in 1945. Now, how will you respond to the doubters who say that there are too many discrepancies in the statements given by the various witnesses? There are inconsistencies regarding the time of landing and, take, and taking off from uh, Taihoku Airport of the ill-fated aircraft. And there are discrepancies as uh, you said that uh, Suresh both also mentioned about the time of death. Why is that? There have, of course, been certain inconsistencies in the depositions of survivors of the crash and eyewitness. For example, who was sitting where in the plane? Were there mm -hmm. 13 
of 14 passengers in the plane? What was the precise arrival and departure time in Taiyuku? What was the plane's height when the explosion occurred? At which precise time did both pass away? These, as you have mentioned today. Mm. Evidence under oath to Khan committee was, as I told you, 11 years after the episode. Yeah. And the Coastal Commission, uh, 25 to 29 years. The memories had faded. But these discrepancies do not falsify the story of the cash. They are due to the passage of time and the memory of witnesses becoming somewhat vague regarding matters of detail. But despite the inconsistencies, there was no disagreement whatsoever among the deponents on the fact of both meeting with the crash, dying at the military hospital, his cremation and the movement of his remains to Tokyo, and resting at Renkoji Temple. On the other hand, a completely consistent deposition by witnesses from different countries and different walks of life, and mm. after so many years, would have meant a tutored and corrupted evidence. Another thing to remember on the time matter, the passengers in the plane, in the plane, they hail from different time zones, some from Philippines, some from Singapore, and others from Saigon. Their times vary plus 730 hours to 900 hours with GMT. There were local times in some places also. Each were carrying their own time. None, I'm sure, adjusted their watches to Formosa time as they were just passing through Taiyoku. So a difference mm. of one and a half years, two hours is quite obvious. Now, okay. who issued, now, the, 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 the doubters also question that who issued the death certificate? And they also say that, uh, you know, they also ask that some Ishiro Okura's death certificate was passed off as that, as that of Netaji's. See, deposition by Dr. Yoshimi, the CMO, tells us he issued the death certificate certificate on the 18th 9th itself hmm. in the name of Chandra Bose and the cause of death as burns of the third degree. The body was next day taken for loading in a plane to be taken to Tokyo. But hmm. it was returned as the coffin was too big to enter the plane. Then it was decided to cremate the body in Taiyoku. Hmm. The other doctor, Dr. Shuruta, told Cornell Figures in 1946, the Figures report, the third report which I am talking about, I talked about. And to the Japanese investigative team of 1955, this is the fifth report which I talked about, that he was asked to issue a death certificate for the purpose of cremation and to give some other name, name other than Chandra Bose, as they mm -hmm. would not, the local uh, Japanese at Taihoku, ta Taiwan, Formosa, they would not like to take the responsibility to declare Bose's death. So Dr. Suruta signed the death certificate on 21st August. He mm. died on 18th, but Suruta signed the death certificate on 21st August and gave the name of Ichiro Okura. No. And the same, his given name was available at the cremation register. But, you know, surprisingly, Suruta, uh, Dr. Suruta, to the Shana's committee report, he surprisingly said he did not issue any death certificate. So these are the confusions that are still there. Okay. And they also yeah. say that the commission... No, they, they all, I tell oh, you that what, what is con confirming, hmm. in response to a government query, the Japanese ambassador in Taiwan in 1956 clarified uh, what I was telling. As the death of Subhash Chandra Bose was kept strictly confidential by the Japanese army at Formosa at that time, it is believed that this cremation permit on Ichiro Okura must correspond to the case of late Subhash Bose. And you know, all the hospital records were taken, uh, the, both the doctors said, were brought over to the military headquarters in Tokyo, but none of the inquiry commission, uh, the team that they inquired at the uh, military headquarters at Tokyo for all these certificates, mm. okay? Then they also say that the cremation registered, uh, you know, the cremation registered also doesn't have the name of Subhash Chandra Bose. Yeah, uh, I, I already mentioned Bose's uh -huh. name is not in the cremation register for the reasons I've given so, you, exactly. the lo local listing. But two other persons of the total six dead, I mean, the six persons died, three died inside the plane, they were completely burned, they were, only the bones were there and the entrails were there. Mm -hmm they were not required to be taken to the hospital or to the any cremation. 
They, everything was finished off over there. But three persons were taken to the hospital. That was Netaji Bose and two other, uh, two other of the uh, six. So uh, one named uh, Dr. Suruta names him something like the Ishida or something like that. He died a few weeks later. And then the assistant pilot, Ayogi, died on 29th September in a different hospital. But Justice Mukherjee couldn't find their names because uh -huh. they died. Uh, they, because Justice Mukherjee checked the uh, cremation register up to 27th August. And these two mm -hmm. persons died well after that. One died month after that. So from where do these <laughs> doubters also, on what basis do they say that the CIA records until 19, uh, you know, uh, show that until 1964, Netaji was alive? Oh, that is incorrect. Uh -huh. By 1946, the Allied forces were certain that Netaji is no more. Mm. CIA documents between 1946 and 48 on, on different categories, Indian, radical left parties, notes on Sarat Chandra Bose, notes on forward block. Those things were declassified in 2000, the CIA records. Everywhere, hmm. they refer Subhash Bose as the late leader. And the supposed CIA records of 1964 telling Netaji is alive is nothing but a twisted information. The Shoilomari Sadhu episode was at its peak at that time, in early 60s. And they just assimilated what was coming out from the Indian press. Mm. There was no findings from their side on the issue. The CIA records, if possible, we will show you. Of 1948, 1946, that they referred Netaji as dead in Indochina in the autumn of 1945. Now, you know, now uh, as you had mentioned about the uh, Justice uh, Mukherjee Commission, now, this was constituted in 1999 when Netaji would have been 102 years old. And now you have exposed glaring holes in this report, which was submitted in 2005 after six long years of work. As you mentioned, this uh, report concluded that Netaji did not die in the plane crash. And the report was trashed by the government. Now, do you think that Justice Mukherjee just did a shoddy job or did he have some ulterior motive in negating the findings of the previous commissions that have consistently concluded that Netaji died after the plane crash? Good that you have asked this question, which I left unfinished before. Hmm. I would not publicly say that he had some ulterior motive, as that is speculation. Okay. But I can confidently say he did a shoddy job. Hmm. And there are a number of reasons, rather his drawback for me to say. Some of them are detailed out in the action tape, tape, in report submitted in the parliament before rejecting the report. If you have time, let me serialize the drawback. One is the Justice Mukherjee was, one I would say Justice Mukherjee was prudent enough to say if really there was a plane crash, the news about the same would have been published in the then local daily. Mm. So he checked up Central Daily News, the name of the paper, Central Daily News, which carried no report on any plane crash at Taihuku in late August 1945. This was Justice Mukherjee's first big mistake. Hmm. He assumed that the Central Daily News was a local daily of Taihuku in 1945. He never took into consideration that Central Daily News was Chiang Kai shek's paper, no, an no. arch enemy of Japan. And so the paper was being published from mainland China not from Taiwan. Mm -hmm. It became a local newspaper of tai Taiwan, Taipei, mm. only in 1945 after Chiang Kai-shek was driven away to Taiwan. Justice Mukherjee referred to a wrong newspaper and failed to find evidence the, of the crash. This fundamental flaw led him towards further erroneous conclusion. Say, mm. in 1956, the Harin Shah, journalist Harin Shah, which I am talking about before, yeah. the post Deposed to the Saunas committee, sharing mm. the names of two, two local dailies. The names are, I think, uh, Taiwan Didi Shimpao and uh, Taiwan Nichi Nichi Shimpao. Pardon me if my uh, uh, names are wrong. One was a Japanese newspaper, local newspaper of uh, uh, 
Kaihoku, and the other was a Chinese newspaper, which mm. had published news of Bose's death due to the plane crash. Shah and another Japanese witness also mentioned that a small obituary notice appeared in the paper. And uh, the contents of, that, uh, of those news are in the Shah, Shah Nawaz committee report. This Shah Nawaz committee report was available to Justice Mukherjee, yet he never examined these newspapers, not even mentioned about his existence in that report. Mm. The next one about the Justice Mukherjee's that he uh, is the same as uh, Suresh Boshe. That's he writes that as testified by Habibur Rahman to the Shah Nawaz committee, the plane nose dived from a height of 12 to 14,000 feet. Mm. And if that is so, Habibur was bluffing as seven of the 13 passengers could not have survived okay. if the plane had fallen from that height. Okay. But the fact is, Habibu never said anything like that to any committee ever. Mm. Rather, he had said that he, they were flying at 12 to 14,000 feet from Torin to Taihoku, oh. the previous flight. Previous flight. Uh, not after taking off from Taihoku. But Justice Mukherjee just cherry picked this figure, 12 to 14,000 feet, and pasted it on the height of the nose diving plane mm -hmm. and accused Rahman was his closest confidant of mm -hmm. making out a story. Then his another legal this thing. He, he, the Taiwanese minister informed in 2003 that Taiwan was under Japanese occupation in August 45. Mm -hmm. And the, they were, the Japanese were there till 25th August, uh, October of 45. While leaving the island, they took away most of the civil and military records. From the leftover record, they could find nothing that supports plane crash in August 45. So, to Justice Mukherjee, what happened? Absence of evidence of plane crash in limited records became an evidence of absence of plane crash. Mm. This is unpart. I mean, a, a legal person, I don't know what to say. Mm. The other thing is Justice Mukherjee summarized that Netaji's death was fake. The plan was engineered by the Japanese authority, the two doctors, Abibu Rahman and Ayar. But Mukherjee mm. does not give any evidence how such plan was engineered before, beforehand. I mean, it's the post-war chaos when the actors were scattered in Tokyo, Taihoku and Saigon. So he makes official. So he makes official a conspiracy theory. Okay. But the real mystery is Justice Mukherjee has meticulously visited the archives of in Russia. But he never queried the Japanese government for anything meaningful. Despite Netaji being last seen with them, he interviewed just one person in Japan. He made no attempt to access the five Netaji files still kept secret in Japan. The mystery is why Justice Mukaji was so casual in Japan? On your query about the ulterior motive, of, with the ulterior motive, I just want to tell you that the government had authorized, given full powers to Mukaji to conduct DNA test of the remains hmm. at Rinkoji Temple. The chief priest agreed through a letter to give the oh. remains for DNA testing. Huh. But Mukaji dilly dallied and put the blame on the chief priest for not giving the remains. Wrongly blamed him. And to, to support his own action, he placed a doctored translation of the chief priest's letter in the Mukherjee Commission report by oh. excluding the key part of the chief, chief priest's letter written in Japanese. See, the government wanted to get the DNA test done, but Mukherjee scuttled it. Mm. <clears throat> now, in your book you've written, uh, despite 10 investigations coming to the same conclusion, story after fantastic story of Netaji living after 1945 kept piling up. Many people, including some of his, uh, some of Netaji's family, would not accept the findings. Now, you mentioned uh, Suresh Bose. Who else from Netaji's family did not uh, accept the findings? Yeah, I would... Uh, naming... Uh... I don't know. While a section of the Bose family understood and accepted Netaji's death in plate crash, I would like to place it this way. The main reason what I could understand from the public statements and what I could deduce, why many in the family did not accept the findings on the plane crash 
was mostly sentimental. Hmm. Their reasoning is guided more by the opinion of their seniors, their predecessors. I don't know how much individually they studied of the lately revealed records, the declassified files. As regarding Sarath Bos, the Netaji's elder brother, hmm. during his lifetime, he did not see any result of any investigations or inquiry hmm. which established Netaji's death. All that he got were hearsay and gossip. In his letter to Emily in 1948, he only spoke of his feeling that Subhash was alive. Never mm. at any time did Sarath say he knew or had evidence that Subhash was alive. Though mm. the headline of his newspaper, The Nation stated that Netaji was in Red China. The subheading, if you look at it, said that government knows it. And he clarified in the detailed news report, if you read, he clarified that though he had no information about Netaji, he had this belief that Netaji was alive. And he furthers it. Oh, yes, sir, yes, okay. uh, and he adds, he must, uh, truly says, it will be futile to search for him. And he may be noted that he started making arrangements to set up a, this is important, he started making uh, arrangements to set up a Netaji museum <coughs> at what is now called the Netaji Bhavan. Would he be setting up Netaji Museum had he knew that Netaji mm. is somewhere alive? The same with Emily, Emilia. Though she dearly hoped and prayed that Subhash could return one day, she never had any definite information that Subhash was alive. Similar to Sarath Bose, she totally believed the news of Netaji's death when she first heard the news over the radio. This is documented in a letter to their common Irish friend, Mrs. Woods in January 46. Then, of course, later, emotion must have taken over to believe mm. that Netaji may still be alive. It is true that Ashoknath, Amyanath, Subrata, and, and Shoilaj Bose, none accepted the plane crash. Mm. And, it, and it is equally true that none accepted the Shoilomari Sadhu or Gumnami Baba story. Okay. And they all lived well beyond 1985 when Gumnami Baba died, supposed to have died. But the most important fact is none of them had any idea of the six investigations carried out by the Allied powers, which established Netaji's death for sure in plane crash, resulting in their giving up the chase to nab Netaji, the most uncompromising leader among the Indians. But today we are much informed after declassification of all Netaji files in India, Russia, UK, USA, Germany, and Australia. See, Netaji did not return after 95, nor has anyone, any recognized authority established that he died in any other way at any other time or in any other place. The world recognized, Japan recognizes his death in Taiyoku in 1945. Only some Indians, that too, mostly Bengali, mm. refused to accept the truth and thus doing great harm to this leader of the leader, his stature, by giving license to generate obnoxious stories like Gumnami Baba. So let's come to Gumnami Baba. You know, that's one of the tall tales that really caught on, you know, of Netaji having become a sadhu and taking the identity of Gumnami Baba. Now, your book is titled uh, Netaji's Gumnami, uh, India's Biggest Hope. So can you? Just briefly tell us about this hoax. See, Gumnami Baba is no tall tale. Tall tale was Shailamari Sadhu of the 60s, right, which I am witness to. Parliament debated the issue for days and over a large span of time. The CIA made note of the developments in the year. You will find n number of government files on, the, on Shailamari among the declassified files. And in hmm. contrast, there is not a single file on Gumnami. It was never discussed in parliament. Gumnami was never discussed in parliament. Perhaps not even in UP assembly. Gumnami is a molehill. See, Gumnami started with a Hindi newspaper of Faizabad in UP, dashing out the news on 28th October 1985, that one Gumnami Baba who was living there and who died 42 days ago on 16 September was none other than Netaji Subhash. Some other newspapers also soon picked up the story. And their story says Netaji did not die in the crash. He mm. faked death and stayed on its 
uh, and they say that he stayed on in Saigon, where Ho Chi Minh was his host. He helped mm -hmm. the Vietnamese in the war against the French. From there, he went to China, mm -hmm. and then to the USSR in '46. There, Stalin, in, the, in their books you find, there Stalin interned him in a gulag for some time, but he managed to gain the confidence of the Russian leadership, and they allowed him to move to China. And he established a secret base in Central Asia from, for some top secret work for the welfare of the world in general, but India in particular. But what welfare he showered on the people of the world and to Indians in particular is yet to be known. Then they say he became a great friend of Mao, Mao Zedong, and devised strategies to help Mao defeat his enemies and gain power. Mao, in return, was loyal to him and helped him to move to India, traversing the Himalayas, all fairy mm. tales. Then yeah. he organized the Tibetan Revolution, disguised as the leader of the Kampa tribe, which is yeah. East Tibet, whereas uh, Dalai Lama came down from West Tibet, and helped Dalai Lama to take refuge in India. He also helped the North Vietnamese in their war against US imperialism. He advised Ho Chi Minh to drop truckloads of cocaine among the American troops, mm. drugging the American GIs, and causing the US to lose the war. And he also played a significant role in the liberation of Bangladesh by training the Mukti Bani. He did, no. did everything for everyone, but mm. not for Indians. None of the other narratives stand scrutiny. There is no established evidence that Netaji escaped the plane crash. There is no evidence that he stayed with Ho Chi Minh or helped Vietnam in their wars against France or the US. Neither the Vietnamese history nor the US or French history records Netaji's or any such clandestine activity in Vietnam post-1945. The Gumnami tale is such a fantasized one, there is no clear-cut story when how <laughs> and how Gumnami entered India, if at all. But why did, India, I mean, just six years ago, in 2016, I mean, the government uh, constituted this high commission, you know, to, 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 to uh, investigate whether Gumnami Baba was uh, uh, was Netaji. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the so why did they do that? Uh, see, uh, that, uh, that was uh, in response to a court order, Allahabad High Court court order, to find out uh, who this Umnami was. So they directed the UP government, and UP government constituted the Sahai Commission huh. in 2016. The commission was in session for uh, over a year. Yeah. During this period, only 35 witnesses turned up. Can you imagine? There was so much halla uh, But only 35 witnesses turned up to depose. And among them, most of them were Gumnamis. Another 10 through affidavit. One of the principal advocates of the Gumnami story confessed to the Sai Commission on cross-examination the impediments which come in the way to vouch for Gumnami as Netaji. And these impediments he lists out as that Gumnami throws three variations, each being difficult to reconcile with the other. One is someone, Gumnami is someone who was a high level international covert player going around the world advising numerous multinational negotiations. Second, he was a highly attained tantric with supernatural powers. And third picture of Gumnami is a person who lived in abject poverty, suffering from ill health from 1960 onward and he was wheelchair bound. This proponent could not explain how a man who claimed he was helping covert military and diplomatic operations of the anti-imperialist bloc in different parts of the world, and who claimed to have played a pivotal role in the 1962 India-China War, 1965 India-Pakistan War, and 1971 Bangladesh Liberation, right. was, able, was not able to fend for himself properly. If Gumnami, then he himself says, if Gumnami was indeed Netaji, he would have been able to give insights of how he escaped from Russia in 1945 and details of the journey from Russia to India. And whatever is given by the others, only sketchy information and cannot be used to connect the dots. Gumnami's many claims are not supported by anything. Everything is unsubstantiated. The very idea that Netaji could live secretly in hiding in such a research condition 
in his own country for such a long time is absolutely impossible. This is what the chief proponent finally surrendered to the Sahai Commission. But let me also now, note. Sorry, go ahead. Carry on. No, uh, now Sahai Commission, I think, presented its findings in 2017, correct? Ah, it yeah. took a year, but now, nevertheless, a book comes out in 2019, just three years ago, titled uh, A Conundrum, Subhash Bose's Life After Death. It's authored by uh, Chandrachur Ghos and Anush Das. They cite an American handwriting expert who concluded that Bose and Gumnami Baba are the same person. This expert, Carl Baggett, reached his conclusion after studying hundreds of letters written by Bose and Gumnami Baba. Now here I quote the Times of India. Now this is from the Times of India. Baggett is an authority on document examination with over 40 years of experience and has completed over 5,000 cases. Certified by the American Bureau of Document Examiners, Baggett has testified as an expert witness in handwriting in all states in the US. He was given two sets of letters to analyze without being told the identities of the writer. After he said they were written by the same man, it was revealed to him that the person in question was Netaji Bose. Baggett stood by his conclusion and gave a signed statement to that effect, unquote. Now the authors of the book, look what they say. They say it's possible that Bose suffered from psychological trauma, perhaps because of torture in Russian captivity which may have forced him to remain in hiding and assume the identity of Gumnami Baba. So what do you have to say to this? This person, I think it's Kurt Baggett. Uh, not, uh, 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 yeah. The report is uh, that uh, Baggett says, huh? Okay. First, one must know that handwriting expertise, that is graphology, uh. is a pseudoscience and not a tool for identification anywhere in the world. The Supreme, if you uh, I'll quote from Supreme Court, Supreme Court of India has clear, clearly categorized that handwriting evidence is the weakest type of evidence. Thus, opinion on handwriting by handwriting expert is non scientific. Mm. And being an unscientific expert often give conflicting opinion. And it is highly unsafe to pass any conviction on such type of evidence. Unless, this is very important, the expert steps into a witness box for cross-examination. And unless he steps into, uh, he's cross-examined by the court, his written opinion has no value. Handwriting okay. evidence being weak, the court has power to examine the handwriting itself. And opinion of the handwriting expert being the weakest type is unreliable unless supported by other independent evidence. The opinion of Kurt Baggett is a procured one. Mm. It has no locus standi, and it is not vetted legally. The proponents of Gumnami are good at doing such things. Earlier, when the Mukherjee Commission was in session, they similarly procured, procured a positive opinion from a private handwriting expert, similarly, private handwriting expert, by appointing him through a media house. Now, keeping aside the legality for the timing, Baggett has given his unverified opinion on only the English writings of Gumnami. But yeah. what about Gumnami's claimed Bengali handwriting? It is shown in my book. There is not an iota of similarity or resemblance between Gumnami's and Shubhas's writing style, pattern, and spelling. These are there in my book. Do you know what explanation these people give no. to these vast dissimilarities between the two handwriting? Mm. They say that Gumnami deliberately used to write in a different style so that his identity is not revealed. So he could confuse people. Mm. That means he, he confused everybody, even the government expert, but could not confuse Baggett. Uh, and uh, uh, the other experts appointed privately by them. Marvelous. <laughs> in a nutshell, in re response to your question, in the absence of any legal acceptance, Kurt Baggett's opinion is not worth a dime. Yeah. Now you have let's, con let, uh, so let's continue in the present now. 
And uh, yeah, uh, just to conclude this conversation also, now, yes, uh, now you, you also must have experienced this. this you know, some people are of the view that uh, Jawaharlal Nehru and the successive Congress governments have allowed, you know, have sort of elbowed out Netaji and the INA from the history books. You know, they've sought, they've sought to uh, bury their contribution to the freedom struggle. What are you, your views on this? This is a political question. Whereas my study has been on the fake story on Netaji's death. Mm -hmm. But as you have asked, as mm -hmm. a general public, I can say, yeah. Netaji has not got his due from successive government in many ways. The allowing of these fake stories, insulting remarks about his wife and daughter are some of the issues which the government can easily take care of. Mm -hmm. That is my response. Now, uh, for the last... 77 years, the Japanese have respectfully looked after the remains of Netaji at the Renkoji Temple in Tokyo. Is it time to bring back Netaji's remains to India? See, Netaji's ambition was to return to an independent India. Circumstances did not let it happen. The best way to honor his wishes in this 125th anniversary year is to bring his remains by 18th August to response uh, to sort of repose on Indian soil. An India government can do it. If technically possible, a DNA test may be conducted. His daughter, Dr. Anita Puff, will thus get the opportunity to perform the pending rituals for the departed soul. And thereby she and we too can fulfill her father's dream of Delhi Chalo and complete his journey from Renkoji to Redport. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much to Meru. Uh, you have made your name not only as an experienced architect, but also as a brilliant investigator. I'm sure your book will be received with much favor by the readers. Now, because of your incredible efforts, I think this never-ending fictitious stories of Netaji being alive after 1945 have finally found an ending. And our beloved leader, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, can at last Rest in peace. Thank you and Jai Hind. Thank you, Akhil.